many movies, Gorgo was partly based on an idea that germinated for years in the back of the mind of its director. In 1953, Eugene Lurier attended a matinee showing of The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, his directorial debut. Also present for the sci-fi dinosaur adventure were his friend Jean Renoir, the acclaimed French director, and Lurier's own six-year-old daughter. Renoir was enthusiastic about Lurier's maiden effort, but the daughter was strangely affected by its climax. The beast dies amidst the flames of an amusement park inferno. On the way home, she began to cry and blurted out, You are a bad daddy. You killed the big, nice beast. The other surprise awaiting Luria in the wake of Beast was the way the money-making movie typecast him as the director of Dinosaur. He ended up directing just four films, three of them with dino stars. When Luria returned from England after directing The Giant Behemoth, 1959, a virtual remake of Beast, filmmaker brothers Maurice and Frank King sought him out and asked if he could dream up yet another sea monster story. Luria again took the tired dinosaur out of retirement, but keeping a promise he made to his daughter, concocted a happy ending for Gogo, an adventure tale incorporating elements of maternal love and family values in the reptile world. Like Gorgo's trek from sub-oceanic caverns to an Irish island to London's Battersea Funfair, the movie's transition from conception to completion was a torturous progression as well. Lurier and his writer friend Daniel Hyatt turned out a screenplay called Kuru Island, set on one of the Pacific Islands and in Tokyo, because Frank and Maurice King were planning to co-produce the film with a Japanese film company. When that deal fell through, the King brothers set their ex-gangster hearts on having their monster trash a European city and began scouting many of Europe's capitals with Lurier. Eventually, the decision was made to shoot the film in England, partly because Tom Howard, head of optical effects at MGM English Studios, is the brightest special effects man in the world, according to Frank King. The script underwent extensive changes as well, many made by new writers who added what Lurier called some violent action and illogical developments. Throughout all drafts, the mother-love angle was retained. The King brothers were very attached to their own mother, and Lurier believed the project appealed to them because of the climax in which the mother comes to the rescue of her baby. Unlike the no-name cast of Beast and Giant Behemoth, Gorgo featured a pair of established leading men. William Sylvester was an American who moved to Britain after World War II and was perhaps the first American actor to become a member of the Old Vic. Even better known was top-billed Bill Travers, a TV, stage, and film veteran well-remembered for his starring role in Wee Gordy, 1956, and for playing Robert Browning in MGM's The Barretts of Wimple Street in 1957. Travers' greatest fame was still ahead of him. He subsequently starred in 1966 Born Free and other popular wildlife films. Travers' final real determination to free Gorgo from its Battersea Park enclosure was an interesting prelude to actual events. Later in life, he and his actress wife, Virginia McKenna, became animal rights activists who campaigned against keeping animals in zoos. Sylvester and Travers were born four weeks apart in 1922 and died within months of each other in the 90s. Even Gorgo's boy star, Vincent Winter, playing a wise beyond his years Irish orphan, was well known. His outstanding performance in The Little Kidnappers, 1953, had earned him an honorary Oscar, like the giant behemoth, Gorgo features no women in significant roles. As one reviewer pointed out, however, the human players were merely stooges. The film's real stars were Gogo and Mama Gorgo, played by stuntmen in rubber monster suits. According to Herman King, we had to build two monsters. Inside the mother, we used a six-foot-two stuntman, and inside the baby, we used a jockey-sized man. What they are, actually, is mechanical engineering feats full of gadgets to control the eyes and tail and whatever with the accessories operated by battery power. Gorgo began production on September 23, 1959 with Maurice King handling administrative duties and cigar-chomping younger brother Frank keeping a close eye on set activities at MGM London Studios. Set visitor Graham Clark of Kinematograph Weekly met and spoke with Frank King, Lurier, and special effects expert Tom Howard, who told him that Gorgo would feature the whole bag of tricks, traveling mat, split mat, slow motion, the lot. On the day of Clark's visit, Howard was preparing to use the whole of stage three, 
3,000 square feet as a tank for the scene where the red-eyed, jaw-snapping Mama Gorgo capsizes the naval destroyer. Scenes set on Nara Island were shot in a port town in Ireland. Cinematography legend Freddie Young of Lawrence of Arabia, Dr. Zhivago, You Only Live Twice, was the director of photography. According to Eugene Lurie, I was marooned with Freddie Young and all his crew in a lighthouse at the end of a jetty in the port of Dunlier near Dublin. The storm was terrific. Waves splashed high above the jetty. The port authorities ordered us to stay put until the storm and tide subsided. Tossed impressively by the mountainous waves, a freighter tried to approach the port. It was exactly like a scene described in the script. I thought it would be a good chance to catch the scene. No way, was Freddy's reply. Later on, I had to shoot the scene with a miniature ship in a studio tank. By September 1960, the filming of final special effects sequences had been completed and the film's evocative musical score was being composed by Angelo Francesco Lavignino. It was later recorded by the 125-piece London Symphony Orchestra led by Muir Madison. While MGM laid plans to release Gorgo in the U.S. as a special attraction, the film made its world premiere in Tokyo in December 1960, opening to the biggest business of any film to play the theater chains in Kobe, Kyoto, and Osaka in the previous 12 months. This blockbuster business was an omen of things to come. Gorgo's February 10, 1961 U.S. premiere at the Fox Theater in Philadelphia broke records and its later George Washington's birthday openings rolled up box office grosses exceeding the figures of other recent major attractions by as much as 40%. Oddly, the country where most of the film was shot was among the last to see it. Gorgo's English opening at London's Pavilion did not take place until October 1961. The lost world-like script of Gorgo is filled with standard plot elements, some of them already used in Laurier's previous dino movies, and perhaps more than its share of missteps, some vague character development, plot threads leading nowhere. But even if the story is spun from a tired yarn, the movie nevertheless looms as large in the genre as Mama Gorgo over the rubble of London. The use of Technicolor and a better class of actor set it apart from the run-of-the-mill monster romp, and it is additionally enhanced by a haunting score which monster musicologist David Schechter has rightly called one of the loveliest melodies to ever grace a monster movie. From volcanic opening to poignant end, the film is filled with flavorful, memorable set pieces. Among them, the torch-lit shark hunt, Travers' suspenseful bathysphere descent, and most spectacularly, the climactic attack of Mama Gorgo upon London. A greater than usual number of famous landmarks, including Big Ben, Westminster Abbey, the Houses of Parliament, the Thames Tower Bridge, and Piccadilly Circus, are laid waste as the 200-foot beast searches for her offspring. Unfazed by the combined military might of the British Navy and Army, NATO forces, and the entire stock footage library. Gorgo was one of 15 films up for nominations for Special Effects Oscar, but eventually only two competed, The Absent-Minded Professor and The Guns of Navarone. Unlike the average monster movie, in which scientists, physicists, and other eggheads are presented as identification figures, Gorgo's story is seen entirely through the eyes of real people, such as the Carl Denimish salvage boatman and the Irish orphan, adding to the unique atmosphere. Monsters belong to the sea and should be left there, Eugene Laurier wrote in Films and Filming. The idea has the charming simplicity of a fable, and as in a fable, ignoring this simple truth leads to catastrophic consequences, Laurier said. A good compromise between desired spectacle and required budget Gorgo is an appealing mix of monster mayhem and human interest, one of the most successful monster movies of all time. <laughs>